graduates, PhD candidates, international guests from across the UK, from Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, and probably elsewhere, I think. So that's amazing um, for a lunchtime event. Um, I did have hankerings after doing this as an evening event on Zoom and, and making it a bit longer, but um, yeah, we'll just, have, we'll just have to be sparing today. Okay, um, it's my honour and delight to welcome Dima Azayat and Leila al Amar today and to thank both of you very warmly on behalf of the Department of English Literature and Creative Writing for coming to speak with us and to read from your truly stunning new books. Here we are, people. These are the covers. Dima's is available right now and you have to read it. Layla's is coming very, very soon and you can pre-order it. It's out in less than a month. OK, so it's such a treat um, to hear from both of you and about both of these books today. So the format of um, this event is as follows. Dima and Layla are going to be in conversation with me and are going to give short readings um, from their new books. And all of that will take about 45 minutes. And then I'll open the conversation to the floor for your questions. Please, as you already have done, I think, keep your mics muted and your screens off until we get to the Q&A session at about quarter to two. Um, when, if you want to ask a question, you can put either or both of them back on to speak with our writers directly. You can also post questions in the chat if you prefer, um, and I can try and retrieve them later, or you could repost them for us when we get to the Q&A session. If you're tweeting, um, I've put our Twitter handles in the chat um, and suggested hashtags, um, or you, you may choose your own. Um, please note that the session is being recorded and it will eventually be made available on the department's YouTube channel, so be aware of that. So our two authors today are both differently Arab-American. They're both written in highly nuanced ways about Syria, among many other things, and they're both dear friends of our department at Lancaster. Dima al was born in Damascus, um, grew up in California and now lives in Manchester, although she's currently sojourning on a farm in Ireland. Um, she completed her PhD in creative writing at Lancaster in 2020, moving her external examiner to tears, if I may embarrass Dima for a moment, and those were tears of in a good way. Um, Dima's doctorate was made up of a version of Alligator and Other Stories, which we'll hear an excerpt from today, and a thesis entitled Arab Americana, Race and Identity Reconstruction in Arab American Fiction, in which Dima charts a move in work by writers such as Randa Jarrar and Rabi al away from honorary whiteness and towards intersectionality and solidarity. Unsurprisingly then, Dima's Creative writing is richly contextualized, rooted in a chronically underexplored history of Arab migrations to the West, but also probing different layers of racial injustice and intersections of ethnicity with gender and class, among other things. Malu Halasa hails a formidable new voice in understanding the complexities of race and identity. The magisterial collection, Alligator, and other stories probes, among other things, how racial difference is made and maintained. And in the title story, which is a real tour de force that sits in the centre of the book, um, called Alligator, Dima disinters the story, the historical precedents, and the traumatic aftermath of a not quite white Syrian American couple who were shot and lynched in Florida in 1929. As we'll see, though, Dima's writing also encompasses much wider themes of belonging, mobility, vulnerability and agency, subtly engaging the structures that have impelled recent mass movements against sexual abuse as well as racial violence in the US and beyond. Alligator and Other Stories was published by Picador in the UK last year and has been long listed for the Penn American Award and the Dylan Thomas Prize. Separate stories have won the ALCS Tom Gallen Trust Award um, 2019, a 2018 Northern Writers Award, the 2017 Bristol Short Story Prize, and several other awards. Dima is, in short, a leading light in the contemporary short story, her favourite favorite genre to date. 
Today, Dem is going to read a passage from the story, Only Those Who Struggle Succeed, a story that could hardly be more contemporary. So the floor is yours, Dema. Thank you and welcome. Thank you. Um, thanks for that wonderful introduction also. Um, so I'm going to read from um, Only Those Who Struggle Succeed. I'm going to start kind of halfway through in my excerpt. So I'm just going to um, just quickly give a little background on this story. It's about a young woman named Lena who's finally landed her dream job at a film studio in uh, Los Angeles. And she's kind of experienced some horrible things um, as an intern at this company, but she's really had to compartmentalize or push aside these experiences in, in order to kind of keep going. Um, okay. When that summer, the Israel-Lebanon War, also known as the Hezbollah War, also known as the Second Lebanon War, began, Lena worried about the people who would be hurt or killed and about her brother who had, as part of his graduate course placement and on account of his fluency in Arabic, gone to Beirut to work. Lena's politics during college had become muted, or rather redirected towards grievances she found abstract and aloof and without connection to her life. She was, of course, aware that her being Arab was problematic and that in such instances, it was enough to refrain from announcing or declaring it outright. This she had learned in friends' living rooms and in shops and offices in which she had worked and classrooms in which she had sat from kindergarten through college. She did not consider herself dishonest for keeping in her current job her background to herself, since she was, as a rule, private. And to that effect, she had absorbed the requirement to pass as one comparable to not speaking of money or lack of it or one's political leanings or the countless other facts about themselves she knew people juggled and hid or presented as needed. She had watched her own parents on several occasions and in public spaces, silence their Arabic in the presence of bewildered or suspicious looks and understood the necessity of such actions. Earlier internships, in addition, had indicated to her clearly and unmistakably that her passing was indeed essential to her success, and that without it, her climb, while not impossible, would become steep and perhaps without end. In particular, a French producer she had interned for, who had, as he said, a certain regard for the Lebanese, who, as he also made sure to say, were different from other Arabs, advised her that others she might work for in the future might not be as worldly as he who understood that not all Arabs despised democracy and freedom and were prone to violence and a hatred of Jews. Her decision to pass then was not consciously taken, but was instead natural and necessary for her desired career, as was the ability to work long hours, suffer lecherous men, and bear occasional derision. When after 1,000 Lebanese civilians had been killed and 1 million displaced, and as her brother went on land from Lebanon to Syria to Jordan in order to return home, she heard the president's assistant call Arabs animals and watch some of her co-workers high five at the news that much of Lebanon had been destroyed and the Arabs broken, Lena felt herself an imposter. The binding that held her together loosened and she saw herself as they might see her if they were to know her as one of the many Arabs whose deaths brought them such joy that day. She felt again as she had several times before that what was possible and what was not was laid bare before her but this time, however, she was alert at both the value of possibility and its cost. It was an amount she knew she was willing to pay and persuaded herself to believe it was even more worthwhile, more commendable to ascend the ranks of a world that, so could, that could so easily shun her. That summer also saw the president of the company take increased notice of Lena. It began with an encounter in the mailroom where he reminded her of their conversation the night of the Christmas party and what a rare and enjoyable exchange it had been. The value of the encounter, he suggested, was his ability to speak genuinely and openly with someone who seemed neither phased nor altered by his status and position. Lena's esteem of the president had remained unchanged in the months since the Christmas party, despite her boss's dislike of the president and the president's occasional reminders to Lena that her loyalty lay with him and the company and not with her boss, whom everyone knew he had been forced to hire. So in the mailroom, Lena again reiterated her respect for the president and confirmed what she believed he hoped to hear, that her ambitions were to remain with the company and to advance her career within it. It was common knowledge that in order for an assistant at Lena's level to gain a junior executive position, she would first be required to serve as the president's assistant. This knowledge served the president's current assistant well, as he perceived Lena to be incapable of usurping him and hence saw a future in which their promotions would be simultaneous. 
he to a junior executive office and she to the president's desk. So as the summer weeks gave way to fall, Lena began increasingly to work with the president directly. And when the whispers reached her ears that soon his assistant would at last be promoted, she was certain her due would come with his. It was shortly after the whispers commenced then that the president complimented Lena, not on the quality of or ethic of her work or even her conviviality and amiable presence, but on her physical appeal. It was a day like all others, except she was ill and had all but lost her ability to speak. The president found her voice made hoarse and hushed, attractive, sexually so, and he said this without embarrassment before proceeding to his messages, as if the comment had not been made or had been and was accepted. This movement from one comment to another was so refined as to be nearly impersonal, and, that, and it was only once this exchange concluded that Lena gathered what had occurred. She sensed, however, that to investigate it, even to herself, was a dangerous act, and she refrained from doing so. so I'll just stop there. Marvelous. Thank you for that wonderful reading, Dima. I was reading along um, in my book as you were speaking. That's great. So many of your um, repeated themes of passing, necessary silencing. Um, and although this is set in the aftermath of 2006 and kind of speaks about a post 9-11 world, it equally reson resonates in relation to the kind of Me Too moment, I think, in terms of that sort of sexual censorship of, of, of the censorship of gendered behaviour that, that so often takes place in the workplace. Um, we're going to come back and ask questions to the two, our two authors together. Um, so we're going to turn straight to Leila, and then we'll we'll um, ask questions of of both of them. So Leila Alama, um, welcome to you, Leila. <laughs> Leila is Kuwaiti American. She completed her MSc in creative writing at Edinburgh, um, and we've just established that both authors actually did their their MAs or their master's degrees at Edinburgh. Um, shortly after finishing her MSc, Leila wrote her first novel, um, The Pact We Made which I also have here, which was uh, reviewed in Vogue um, and The Observer and other places. The novel is about the never entirely resolvable choices of a single woman in her 30s in contemporary Kuwait and was published by Borough Press in 2019. Leila has also published short stories in a range of venues, including The Evening Standard, um, Aesthetica magazine and the collection Underground Tales for London of 2019. Layla was a guest on BBC Radio 3, but Radio 4 and at the Edinburgh Book Festival in 2019, um, speaking about and reading from her first novel. She's also been a British Council writer in residence. Alongside all of this, Layla is also in the second year of a PhD in English, writing a thesis provisionally entitled inconsolable before history, archives of, of traumatic memory in modern Arab women's fiction. One of the writers Leila's working on in her thesis is the esteemed Lebanese novelist Hanal al-Sheikh, who has described Leila's fiction in turn as courageous, radical and lyrical. It's also routinely described as fierce, which makes me laugh for reasons we won't get into. <laughs> Um, Leila's eagerly awaited second novel, Silence is a Sense, comes out again with Borough Press next month. It centres upon the experience of a Syrian refugee living in a tower block in a northern British city who does not or cannot speak, but who writes under the pseudonym The Nameless because her name is one of the things she can count on the fingers of one hand that she has from home. Our protagonist is, no spoilers, inevitably drawn into the turbulent life of her neighbourhood, as an analogy, perhaps, for the untenability of compartmentalisation. So think, rear window meets the black hole that is post-2011 Syria meets Brexit Britain. It's a combustible stuff. And we're privileged to get a sneak preview from Leila's second novel today. Over to you, Leila, and thank you. Thanks for that, Lindsay. Thank you. Um, so 
just just to kind of preface the part that I'm uh, going to read from, uh, it's it's from a, a recurring scene, I guess, in the novel. Uh, it's called the Eye. The chapter is called the Eye, and and this same scene um, recurs in different guises uh, three times at least throughout the novel, and. Um, the core of it is a very traumatic memory for the protagonist, um, and that's why she kind of has a compulsion to revisit it uh, without ever really uh, concretizing it, I guess you could say. So the way that it appears uh, is through different balances, I guess you could say, where she's not actually getting into it, um, but you can kind of hopefully grasp what what the trauma there is um and it is about her um preparing for protests and sitting with her love interest khalid and her friends uh when they were participating in the protest back in syria before before she left so here we go the cell is limbed in red hazy a fine metallic mist hangs in the air latching itself to the tongue and sliding down a clenched throat. A blood drop sun pulses in the sky. Its rays burn like acid, like gas, like the chemicals he swears he isn't using. Look around, everything is red. The aluminum desks, the white tiled floor, the yellow sponge spilling out of the cracks in the leather chairs. It is all bathed in a heavy maroon glow. No matter how hard I scrub, the window pane will not let in anything but red, red rays. The cell is bordered in oxblood, in burning embers, like a smoldering fire pit. The cell, the word, the concept, looms large in our imagination. Room, house, prison, country, all of themselves. All these places where you are watched and heard and monitored. The only safe space is the one between your ears or in the grave. Usama and Ahmed have blood on their faces and they labor over a fabric that matches. They move their markers over the cotton in silence. Nothing to hear but the scratch as the tip traverses the surface. Painting it in heavy helmeted thugs with stern mouths and tanks crushed by flowers and birds soaring over water wheels. Death before humiliation, death before humiliation, death before humiliation is repeated a hundred million times in a hundred million ways. We are trying to tell you that there are worse things than dying. High in the corner, the eye watches us. Like every other time and in every other place, it watches us. The veins are more prominent today, bulging red veins that beat to a soundless rhythm back and forth, back and forth, no brain behind to interpret what it sees. The huddle is gone this time. It's only Usama and Amr bent over the desks, me by the windows and Khalid against the wall. His gaze moving between the eye, the painting of the fabric and the dead world outside. He's in a beige jumpsuit, a white helmet dangling from his fingertips and he looks more tired than there are words for. Do you know they call you a liar now, my love? A propagandist? A terrorist even? Terror. Terror is no longer the one-two explosion of barrel bombs or the pop of gunfire or the knock on the door. No, we have redefined it. Terror is the silence between explosions, the quiet before the knock on the door before the bullet hits its target and you can breathe again because this time it wasn't you. We are breathing because outside the bombs have not stopped falling. We inhale one and exhale the other. It's like silent, it's like thunder behind the eyes, like a thousand drums beating in your chest, like the walls of existence are collapsing all around you all at once. It is like no sound you've heard before. It's done, says Amr, straightening up and cracking his back. Osama concurs with a nod and answering crack of his neck. Yalla! 
We, the three of us, roll up the fabric until it's a thick scroll. We carry it to the open windows. I turn to ask Khaled to join us, but he's under the eye now, inspecting it, reaching up with hesitant hands to poke at it as though it might bite, and my breath catches in my lungs. Yalla, Osama says again, prodding me to release my end of the fabric. We let go, and the cotton unfurls down the side of the building. It's met with silence, a silence so complete it seems to have swallowed the world. The banner flaps and slaps against the wall, dripping red and black onto the empty street below. The wind catches it, ripping the fabric from our hands and sending it flying over the buildings. The heavy thugs and tanks detach. Inky blobs fall to the pavement without a sound. The flowers burst forth into color and the water wheels and birds go spinning and screaming into the sky. Behind us, there's a crash. Khaled is attacking the eye with his helmet. My heart stops as he hammers at it, furious, desperate. It drowns out any and all other sounds. Bashing and bashing, he lets out short grunts and yips and what sound like whimpers until the eye cracks and splinters and is ripped from the ceiling to lie in a broken heap at his feet. He's sweaty, jaw locked in a grimace, panting like a feral animal, like the wolf they've turned him into. Is this victory or just another kind of death? Thank you. Thanks, Leila. That was amazing. Um, I foolishly realized too late that there are at least two chapters called the I. So now I'm lost and don't know exactly where the um, section was. There's three of them. Three of them, right. Yeah. Official ones, I guess. Your page numbers are probably different from mine, but that was amazing. And there's a lot of kind of patterning of the images and the and the phrases across those those chapters. All right. right. So moving on to ask the two of you some questions. Some of them are for you, for you separately, and some of them are joint questions. Um, Leila, I'm wondering what compelled you to write about Syria specifically in this novel. And Dima, what sort of presence does Syria have in your collection of stories? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I, I, I don't. It wasn't really a conscious choice to write about Syria. I mean, I don't make conscious choices in my writing. I feel compelled to write something, for lack of a better word, and and that's the story that comes out and. I'd been following the Arab Spring since it began in late um, late 2010. Uh, I'd been particularly horrified by the breakdown in Syria that happened very, very rapidly, and particularly horrified by the refugee crisis. Um, so all of those things were kind of percolating in my head for the better part of a decade. Mm -hmm. um, and then in 2017, over that summer, uh, I was in Edinburgh and I, I was standing in, in an apartment looking at the apartment complex across the way and I could see the people there, you know, going about their lives, going about their business. And I just, I got this voice in my head that was kind of narrating what was happening and what I was seeing. And this is what usually happens is that I get a voice and I just start following the voice without any kind of conscious thought. And I wrote, I guess, about 8,000 words in the space of a day, just this kind of rambling commentary slash monologue. Mm. Um, and in that process, it became very clear that, that, that the voice that I was hearing or the, the story that I was feeling compelled by was that of a, a Syrian refugee who's been settled in an unnamed British city and is is trying to come to terms with this new reality. And so it all kind of followed on from there. But I mean, serendipitously, about six six weeks or something, like something ridiculous, it was less than two months after I started writing, I met a Syrian refugee just by chance down in London through a mutual friend of ours. Um, and I ended up, uh, you know, dedicating it to him in the acknowledgments as well. Um, that that just kind of all came together, and I was like, yeah, this this feels like 
the story that's that's happening or that's coming out. Brilliant. Yes, I can see that acknowledgement right at the end of the um, novel. And I should say, um, for accuracy here, that um, uh, Layla's protagonist is called the voiceless uh, when she <laughs> not the nameless. I know that she's called the voiceless. Although she is unnamed until the end. So. Until very yeah, close to the end. There's a there's a little hint a little bit earlier, and then the reveal comes in, in the final kind of chapters. Okay, and what about you, Dima? Um, what sort of presence does Syria have in your collection? Because your family is part Syrian, right? Um, I mean, I were my family's all Syrian because um, both my parents are Syrian, and uh, I was born in Syria, and um, we saw a family in Syria. So it's very much. Um, I think it would have been uh, impossible for Syria to not appear in the collection, mm -hmm. um, but it very much is. Um, I, I would say that uh, the way that it appears is. Um, I guess that m m more closely mirrors my understanding or experience of, of Syria, which would be a Syrian American um, experience, which um, is, you know, uh, I guess anytime we're talking about like immigrant culture or diasporic culture, it's, it's going to be, you know, um, different than um, whatever the originating culture is. So that's, I think that, that that's how it manifests in, book is um this uh there are characters who are located in the u.s but uh, maybe mentally emotionally are still located in syria which is definitely my experience of um older syrian americans in my family mm -hmm. um but yeah so there there are characters that are kind of you know there's second generation there's third generation so they are, though, I guess, under the umbrella of, of Syrian-American mostly, though. Mm, great. Yeah, I mean, although you're dealing with different generations of, of migrants here, that's something that comes across in both books, actually, that Syria has this kind of latent or remembered or haunting presence that, that runs through both collections. And Layla, it's, it's, it's very immediate and it actually kind of punctures the daily existence of, of the protagonist in, in ways that she can't really control. Um, in related fashion, and this is something Leila and I have, have discussed on and off over the last year, I'm wondering how each of you negotiates the burden of representation, which is so often placed upon Arab writers in English or writers of Arab um, heritage in English. That is the obligation to speak for a whole community, perhaps in counterpoint to long-standing misrepresentations of the Arab and Muslim worlds. Um, in English literature or, or to, to English reading audiences. Um, and Leila wrote about a related authenticity imperative in The Guardian last year. So I wonder what either of you have to say about this burden of representation, whether you feel it, how you negotiate it, um, what your stance on that is. Um, I, I'm happy to go. Um, so, I mean, I think it's, uh, kind of double-edged in that I don't I didn't set out to represent the Arab American or the Syrian American or whatever you know um but literature produces cultural representation whether we want it to or not so I was very much aware that this was going to happen whether or not it was what I had set out to do um and that being said, while the stories, as I was writing them, I wasn't consciously like trying to be didactic or, you know, to, to um, I guess, yeah, represent. Um, I was trying to um, complicate some essentialized knowledge of what an Arab American was, what a Muslim American was. And so, um, so I guess in that way, I was very much, even in the writing, dealing with the politics of representation. Um, what was interesting is once the book came out, a lot of re um, reviews, um, you know, while they, they were positive and nice and all of that, they also, some of them, you know, called it a, a, a collection about, let's say, refugee stories or Arab women. And I wasn't writing about either of those things as far as I understood it. So it was interesting to see how how sometimes the reception could only be 
the reception itself was was limited in that there was there seemed to be an inability to understand these stories as kind of how I understand them, which is American stories, because to me, um, the Arab American experience is an American experience. So that was, I guess maybe I should have expected it more, but that was surprising and, and, and um, maybe a good um, lesson in there somewhere, but that's, I guess I'll hand it over to Leila now. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, hey. that's something that resonates on my end as well. And, um, when when my first novel came out and we were going through the publicity and the marketing of it here in the UK, I, I told my editor, I was like, I don't think I became an Arab Muslim writer until you you started marketing this book. Like, that's not how I thought of myself because I grew up in Kuwait. I grew up surrounded by Arab Muslim women. The, the idea of that being the primary marker of my identity just wasn't in my head. And so in many ways, um, you know, getting these books published has created that identity marker for me where it wasn't something that was prominent in my head. Um, but I was, I was, you know, constantly asked, you know, this is the, the novel about Kuwait, as though there could be any novel that, inca you know, encapsul encapsulates a whole society. And then I got criticized for saying, uh, you know, where people said, well, this is just talking about a certain social class of Kuwaitis. It's not representative of all Kuwaitis. And I was like, well, I didn't set out to do that. Um, so that's, that's constantly this, this conversation that has to happen of, are you confirming or like conforming to what the West thinks they're going to hear? And this, this is something that irritates me when, when people immediately label a traumatized woman as a victim. I get like very, very rage filled <laughs> at that and I constantly go after it because it, it immediately shuts down the conversation and it creates this frame, as you said, by which to look at the work rather than the other way, looking at the work without mm -hmm. a frame around it. Um, and, you know, it's interesting what you were saying because the reception of my novels and particularly the pact we made in the Arab world or in the Gulf from readers there has been completely different from its reception in the UK or in the West, if you want to say in the West. The things that they pick up on are are much more in line with not, you know, my intentions in writing, but the way that I view the literature is it's much more in line with that. And so um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if this is a conversation that we will ever be able to stop having, but, um, uh, this, this idea that there's one way to look at this literature is, is demonstrably false, I think. Mm. And losing sight of the sort of the crafting that goes into these things and the fact that they might be informed by a voice, as you, as you said earlier, that you're not necessarily in full control of what you choose to write about. But then this kind of very, very detailed crafting process happens and shapes the reality of the book. Um, I was thinking about the novelist Aminata Fauna, who has also pushed back against pigeonholing. And she says that classifying is the very antithesis of literature and that she's never met a writer who wishes to be described as a female writer, gay writer, black writer, Asian writer or African writer. You know, the the writers should have the right to draw upon their own heritage or to put themselves completely into a different world, into a different skin, as it were. OK, um, changing, a, changing tack a little here. Dima, can you tell us a little about the process of constructing Alligator, the title story? Um, which has a particularly ambitious form. It's like a collage, um, bringing together different types of fictional and historical, and I think fabricated historical narratives. Um, and it spans the perspectives of several generations um, from within this family and, and also out with this family. So how was this complex structure vital to the story you wanted to tell in Alligator? Um, I think, well, 
I will say because um, this is, uh, you know, I'm speaking to you, and so it, maybe it'll be interesting to who's listening in, is that my PhD research actually played a really important role in writing the story, and that um, I was researching really how, or thinking about how race informs contemporary Arab American fiction, um, and I came across this story in kind of researching Arab American racialization. I came across this story of um, a lynching of a Syrian couple in Florida in um, the 1920s and became really interested in it and c learned as much as I can about it. And when I started writing the story of, one of this couple's um, children and I found myself writing, you know, the children's voices in, in, in fragments and kind of um, really before I knew it, I found myself inserting some of the historical documents that I had found in my research into the story because it, I, initially it felt like their accounts were, these imagined accounts were incomplete without some of these documents. And as I developed the story, um it 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 kind of exploded in a way and that all of these other um stories that that i guess the story itself unearthed so if i'm talking about for example um racial violence towards arab americans in the 1920s in the south of the us it became imp impossible to talk about that without also addressing um, the lynching of Black Americans at that time, and then it became impossible to talk about a very specific location in the South that had been taken, um, the land was taken away from indigenous, indigenous Americans and not kind of probing that past. And and so it, it really became a very, I guess, layered historical project. Um, and I guess the best way now that I can kind of think about it is what I was looking for was um, a form that could reflect the content. And the content was so much about trauma and failed assimilation and dislocation and, um, and the fragmentation really suited that content in that it made it um, impossible to what, what I hoped would be impossible to kind of walk away with from that story having really conclusive meanings or um, kind of one finite understanding of you know um, r racial history in the U.S. and or um, I also very much wanted to track which seemed really interesting to me but very difficult to track the making of, of race and in this instance, the making of Arab American whiteness and having the, um, I guess, the, the historical documents real and imagined and the, the prose segments kind of mash up against each other made it possible to kind of maybe, if not in a linear way, understand the making of um, race, but kind of understand how how over time, you know, that arc occurs. So, um, mm -hmm. so <laughs> yeah, brilliant answer. I mean, there's something Toni Morrison-esque about that, but I, I love the way that the story sits there just after halfway into the collection and it kind of gathers together all the threads that have been sort of bubbling away under under the surface of these stories it pulls everything together and kind of detonates there in the in the middle of the collection it's amazing um actually Layla's um novel as well science as a sense also juxtaposes different kinds of writing um emails reportage uh realist and as we've heard more surrealist passages or perhaps reminiscent of what Iraqi refugee writer Hassan Blasim calls nightmare realism um and it has even an embedded harrowing short story um, in the novel that's reminiscent for me of Ghassan Kanafeni's um, Palestinian classic Men in the Sun. Um, so I was wondering too, Leila, with you, this kind of restless, promiscuous style of the novel, what drives that? 
Um, yeah, you know, for me, I think, it, you know, it's a lot of what Dima was saying as well, where, um, you know, this, this kind of inability to arrive at conclusive truths. Mm. Um, and for me as well, what I wanted to um, perform, I guess, in the novel is that this is the way we receive reality now. I mean, we, we don't receive our stories from one source. We, we create our image of the world or our image of our realities through emails, through articles we read online, through tweets, through stories, you know, short stories, through novels. It comes at us from many, many different uh, sources and in many different forms. And so I really wanted to show that in the book that... Um, that that this collage style mirrors the way we function in our daily lives and that it might be a more effective way i guess of transmitting certain truths or certain ideas and you know it's like certain forms are spun in a in a different way you know the news is generally not objective and unbiased it's you know there's an agenda there there's there's a purpose behind what you're reading and the same thing with you know certain op-ed articles even the voiceless her articles themselves they're they're not objective um you know uh, reporting on on the life of an immigrant it's it's necessarily influenced by her own feelings and and then there are all these tweets which are subject to you know character constraints but they're still transmitting ideas and information and so that's that's kind of what i wanted to highlight with that style was was the idea that um this is how we receive our world nowadays and the sense of reality and, and kind of world inhabiting as being always negotiated. Um, I mean, I had to laugh that the, the voiceless is constantly negotiating with this pretty annoying um, editor about what she should put in her stories and whether there should be more personal stories and about memories. And it's like she's quite a kind of um, she's a very opinionated writer and she really pushes back against these these expectations. Uh, we keep touching upon trauma, though, so I, I think we need to consider this. Um, I mean, you've both written in different ways about trauma as being not only individual and related to specific instances, but also it's collective, it's transgenerational. Um, the voiceless refers to the wounded psyche of a people and suggests that, I'm quoting, the truths cannot be revealed or they are so terrible that we must hide them in the spaces between our words. And um, in the extract that Leila read to us, I think terror was redefined as the silence between explosions. Um, I, I'm getting the impression that you both have a shared scepticism about um, literature being used as some kind of therapy, as sort of working out the trauma and coming to some sort of resolution. So is there anything more you want to say about how traumatic history manifests in your experiments with voice and form in your writing. You can go ahead. Um, yeah, um, you know, tra trauma is a huge theme that I keep going back to in my writings, both, as you say, in an individual personal level and on a collective, um, more political level. And and with this, this novel, it kind of melds the two because she is subject to quite personal uh, traumas, but it is kind of overlaid by this political framework um, and this collective catastrophe that that is Syria, um, you know, in, in the wake of this war. Um, and, you know, I think that th this is a conversation also that's been happening, you know, in my research in terms of uh, refugee and asylum seekers, you know, where there's this kind of fundamental inability to reconcile the kind of trauma that these refugees and asylum speakers are speaking of. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you have these health workers or, you know, office, home office employees who are trying to fit that into a certain idea or a certain framework of how we speak about trauma. And so that, that was kind of an underlying tension of, you know, perhaps very well-meaning psychiatrist, you know, that, that she she talks to in the book, mm -hmm. but it's like they're speaking a different language. You know, she's she's trying to fit the pain and the trauma into categories and labels and, you know, something that is 
fits her understanding of it as an individualized, uh, somewhat apolitical experience, you know, which is kind of a Western understanding of trauma versus the, the very complex, interlaced, overlapping, um, chronic trauma that 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 the the main character has experienced and is continuing to feel the effects of. Yeah. Um, uh, I guess I would say in, in thinking, I mean, obviously Alligator deals a lot with trauma and, and even in thinking about the rest of the stories, I think there are, yeah, there are probably, um, some of the characters are definitely dealing with traumatic experiences. And I think um, when I'm, writing stories i you know i always start with a character and i'm very much i write from a place of character i don't really think about um plot at least not initially and i'm very much interested in thinking about how um what it is that my character is grappling with whether it's um and i guess you know this is what we call the politics of of identity or and, and we know that the tr there are specific traumas and their specific um backgrounds and so I'm really interested in the power that those things hold in my characters lives um, because I think that you know it's I guess it's a good reminder that anytime we're talking about these grand acts of violence like war or racism or whatever it is that they are affecting individual lives and so that's really how what I'm interested in is probing that the, that individual um, impact. And so um, I guess in terms of how it's affected the writing itself and form itself is it, it took different, I guess, shapes and different stories. So in, for example, there's a story called Once We Were Syrians in the book and the, the speaker is this um, older woman and she's really grappling with the loss of what she initially sees is her name, her family name that had a lot of weight in Syria. Mm -hmm. And, um, but really she's also mourning the loss of her country and also um, a very personal traumatic event that she'd experienced as a child that she's, that she's submerged um, and is, and only comes out in the telling. And so um, in that way, like the way that that manifested for, you know, um, stylistically in the story is, is I guess, um, a very circular narrative where she's circling that trauma, um, and kind of coming closer and closer to touching it before mm -hmm. it, it kind of erupts. So that, you know, it, which was a very different way to approach trauma, um, stylistically than I did in, in Alligator, which is to fragment the narrative and to have, um, different bits of text and conversation with each other um i guess to show i guess the the temporal break that occurs in how people experience trauma and to show the the impact um of the past on present events so it did interestingly um i guess yeah you know the again not to repeat myself but i do think that I was, and this is what I love about short stories, is I was very, it was, uh, I was very interested in finding forms that could hold the content that I was working with. And so that led to um, kind of interestingly different, very different um, stories formally in, in the one collection. Yeah, brilliant. Now, obviously I could hog the two of you all day and I have a, a million other questions. Um, but we have 12 minutes um, to open this conversation to the floor. So if anybody would like to ask Dima uh, and or Layla a question, um, you can use the raise hand function at the, on the toolbar um, or just jump in and put your mic on and, and ask a question. Um, would anybody like to start? Or pop it in the chat, that's the other option. Don't be shy now, lovely audience. <laughs> I'm sure you have loads of backup questions if no one has anything. <laughs> you do know that I tend to be over-organized. <laughs> I do have a question about Arabic. 
um, while people are perhaps gathering their thoughts. Um, and obviously you both write in English and English is one of your first languages in both cases. Um, but Arabic does appear throughout your books, sometimes covertly, I think, sometimes more explicitly. Um, I mean, Dima's collection starts with the story called Russell, um, which is never, I mean, it's explained through the content of the story, but it isn't glossed as such, is it? And Silence is a Sense also contains some Arabic, as we heard. Some of it is not glossed or explained. Some of it actually isn't even transliterated, which is an interesting innovation. Um, so I'm wondering what purposes does Arabic serve in your writing, but also how much of a free hand do you have in what, how much Arabic you can use and how much you have to kind of explain culturally specific concepts to your to your audiences? Yeah, um, I mean, for me, uh, I, I always tend to have some Arabic in the texts, uh, whether, as you say, it's transliterated or, you know, in this one, they actually let me have some actual Arabic texts, mm. you know, in certain parts of it, which was very exciting for me. Mm. Um, uh, you know, for me, my barometer on how much I need to explain is really my agent and my editors. If they don't feel like they need an explanation and they can kind of understand it from context, then I'm good to go. Um, for for the American audience, things tend to be, you know, they, they need a little bit more or they, they like to have a little bit more um, exposition and a little bit more explanation about certain things. I try to resist as much as I can, but there is a certain amount of compromise, I think, that that takes place. But for the most part, I don't tend to gloss the Arabic at all, if I can get away with it. Um, I, I guess, yeah, I would um, agree with that. I would say that um, I, I, I guess I also just, I mean, I imagine that my characters are often thinking in Arabic or at least partially in Arabic or their references are Arabic. So it would be so I think just very naturally the Arabic makes its way into the the, the text, whether it's um, Arabic vernacular in English or whether it's actual Arabic words. Um, I definitely resist um, translating as well as I think even like um, italicizing Arabic words was something that my U.S. publisher initially um, kind of raised was something that they wanted to do because they thought that that was, you know, the, the convention. And that is the convention, of course, you know, for many publishers. But luckily, I think that is changing. And so that was something that they were, you know, really great about understanding um, my reluctance to do that. And so I think um, I do think some of these things are changing. And I, I think um, especially in a U.S. context where um, so many writers now are, you know, whether it's Spanish or um, Chinese, or I'm just thinking of recent examples that I would have read, are, you know, words in other languages are kind of worked into English text, and that's happening more and more. Um, and I think that that works and it's fine. And I think I write for readers at different levels. There's going to be some readers who are going to understand every cultural reference and every Arabic word and some who won't and some can Google it. And if you don't want to Google it, you're probably going to still understand the story. And so um, I think translating immediately as assumes a reader and a certain type of reader. And I, and I really resist that because even I, as an Arab American reader, reading Arab American books over the last 10 years, have found myself oftentimes really irritated at the over explanation of, of culture and language. And, you know, and, and it becomes very apparent that this book isn't really written for me. And so, um, and so that's something that I'm very aware of and um, was very integral, I think, to my pro project in this book is, um, not writing to a certain type of reader, but writing to multiple readers. And really at the core of that, I think is very much writing to an Arab American reader and other levels of readers around that. That's brilliant. Yeah. yeah. We do have a couple of questions coming in now. Um, there's a question from Teddy Kana. 
Teddy, do you want to put your mic on and ask a question? Teddy's a student of mine. Oh. Hi. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, um, I wanted to ask um, Leila what you mentioned about um, uh, resisting the idea of your uh, of traumatized women being labeled immediately as victims. Um, I wanted to ask if you'd um, elaborate on that and, and talk a little more about about what that what that issue or that conflict is with that idea. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a good question, and it's something that I do talk about uh, quite a bit um, in that Guardian piece as well that that Lindsay mentioned earlier. Uh, you know, uh, when when you when you give the label of victim, that that immediately uh, creates a kind of framework through which to understand this character. Um, and it, it's kind of like a word association. You know, you hear victim and you think weak, you think submissive, you think passive, you think uh, oppressed, you think all of these, you know, quite specific connotations. But to be traumatized doesn't necessarily imply that you're a victim. Uh, you know, to be traumatized means to undergo a certain trauma and to, to be able to deal with that. It doesn't carry that kind of negative ideological implication that victim has which is particularly harmful when you're using it in conjunction with uh, an Arab slash Muslim character who is already overburdened with this idea of being a victim of, you know, oppression and, you know, the barbaric Arab men in her life, you know. So there's already this kind of negative load that Arab women have, Arab Muslim women have just simply by existing. And then to overload that with the, the label of victim further closes the conversation. You know, I think it further constricts the way that we can talk about these characters and it becomes very easy to dismiss them. Thank you. We've got a question from Artie. Hello, Artie, another old friend of the de department. Do you want to put your mic on, Artie? Hi, thank you. Um, thank you so much, Leila and Dima, for your wonderful readings. I wanted to go back to the uh, topic of the politics of representation that Lindsay brought up earlier. And I think, was it Dima who said, um, the Arab American experience is an American experience. And Leila, you also said something about how your writings are perceived differently in the in Kuwait than they are perceived in the West. So could you like talk more about like publishing industries and how that has like like as your position, your positions as writers, I mean, does that like hinder your writing or, or does that like weigh in at the back of, you know, at the back of your mind as you're writing? And like, what's the difference? Like when you're right, you know, how, how does that shape the text? Like, you know, when, how is your text perceived in the Arab world or in the Western world? Um, yeah. Um, well, I'll say that uh, while I was writing, um, believe it or not, I never thought about actually publishing. <laughs> so I had the freedom to kind of just write what I wanted to write. Um, I think I, which, you know, these stories were in over several years and then both became a more cohesive um, project as a collection while I was doing the PhD. So um, I was very lucky in that way. I do think that um, when I, was then trying to get the collection published, there was a lot of um, confusion about what the collection was because it, for some publishers, it didn't seem Arab enough. They didn't, they couldn't quite pinpoint what it was. Um, I think it was a, a one publisher said that they already had a Syrian refugee book and I'm not, you know, the book's not about Syrian refugees. So there was um, someone I think said that they already had an author named Dima and that it would confuse their readers. So that's, um, so that's the, some of the kind of stuff that um, I dealt with in um, when the book was first sent out. Um, I think that I think you be, I became very, I was already aware, but I think I became newly aware of how um, non-white American writers are not really perceived as wholly American, if that makes sense. And it re reminded me of something that Toni Morrison always talked about um, and kind of her project to really portray America uh, from a Black perspective. And this was somehow um, radical to reify Americanness as a Black concept. But of course it is. Um, and 
Um, and so in, in some similar way, um, it is kind of this book for me is, is claiming a space of Arab Americans as Americans. Um, so I'll s stop talking and let Layla speak now. Um, yeah, I think that's that's a really interesting point that that you bring up. And, you know, this idea of representation, I, I always I always wish that we can get to a place where it's OK to just be and that that's enough without having to to have these kinds of conversations about my right to be here or or what that being here looks like and how do we talk about it and what language do do we use because these things never enter my mind when i'm writing it's not something that i ever ever think about and you know one of the first questions my my editor asked before they they bought the book in in the states was and it's a question I've gotten many times since is, well, you're not Syrian and you're not a refugee. So why do you have the right to write this book? It's not your story. Um, and there's many there, you know, this is a very complex argument and there's, there's, you know, there's many ways to get into it. And there's certainly nuances on, on both sides, but they were framing it in a way of, well, if we publish this book, we're taking that space away from a Syrian refugee writer. And my thinking is, well, why are you policing the space in that way? Why are you saying that the market can only handle one novel about the Syrian war or one novel about a Syrian refugee? Why are you creating those rules and, and then saying that writers have to abide by that space that you are carving out in a very specific way? Like, yes, we want to hear these stories, but we're just going to give you this little space in which to talk about it. Um, and I kind of reject that that whole idea, whether it's it's about books that I write or whether it's about any other books. I mean, the Guardian piece I wrote was about My Dark Vanessa, you know, which is a, a kind of a story about a it's like a, a Lolita story. Um, and some controversy came up in terms of the writer's right to write that story, um, which is something that that I constantly feel that we have to defend our right to write the stories that we want to tell against a publishing industry that is framing the argument in a certain way by saying that we don't have space in the market for more than one of these books. And, and that's just a fallacy. It's not, it's not true, you know? I am aware that we've run out of time. <laughs> An important point on which to wrap up, I think. Let's focus on the writing, not on the right to write, um, and less policing of the frames. Everyone, if you'd like to put your microphones on to um, give Dima and Leila a, a warm round of applause. That was amazing. And we could have spoken. Thank you, everyone.